Good to go. Good to go, Mr. Duval. Okay. This town of Adams Board of Selectmen workshop is now in session. I will read to everyone the governor's order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. Um, and the governor's orders imposing limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place and or the DPH's designation of yellow red for the town of Adams. This meeting of the town of Adams Board of Selectmen is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public has been permitted, but every effort has been made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. Um, those present uh, in the room, the Board of Selectmen, uh, to my right, I have Vice Chair Christine Hoyt. To my left, I have Howard Rosenberg, who was just recently elected. Um, we have calling in uh, Selectman Joseph Nowak, and Selectman um, Rick Blanchard was unable to uh, make the meeting this evening. Also in the room this evening, um, is State Representative John Barrett III, I Birch's reporter Jack Carino, It's the Eagle reporter Larry Parnes, Deb Dunlap, Administrator, Administrator, to, administrative Assistant to uh, the Town Administrator Board of Selectmen, got to be careful with that name, <laughs> Jay Green, Town Administrator, command, uh, Donna Season, Special Projects Coordinator, uh, and Crystal Wojcik, our town accountant. Uh, Jay, could you uh, identify the individuals calling in, please? Most certainly. So we have on the call tonight our distinguished Lieutenant Governor, Karen Polito, uh, followed by Mr. Jose Delgado, who's the uh, administration's Western Mass Chief of Staff. We have Mr. Chris Bone from Ty and Bond, Mr. Dan Root from Ty and Bond. We have Ms. Kathleen Wall, who I had the pleasure of working with in North Adams, Mr. Nat Carnes, member of our zoning board, Mr. Robert Tober, our DPW director, Mr. Sean T. Pierce from EOEAA, uh, and Mr. Novak is on the call as well. Have we heard from Joe? Is Joe out there? Yeah, I'm here. Well, I'm here. to hear from you, Joe. So I want to make sure. Um, this evening, we, uh, I'd like to request to the board uh, if we get a consensus to move up on the agenda um, the announcements under section uh, agenda item four, move that up to the beginning of the meeting. Is the board okay with that? Yes. You okay? Yes. yes. Joe, you good with that? Yes, I am. Okay. I'd like to hand this over to Town Administrator Jay Green. Thank you, Mr. Duval. It's my pleasure as Town Administrator to uh, gather everybody here today. A little quick background. We had anticipated a, a Selectman's workshop just to go over some engineering aspects with our wastewater treatment plan. Uh, and I received a, a telephone call that has been long awaited by the people of Adams from um, Governor Charlie Baker. Governor Baker was kind enough to inform me that uh, the admin Baker Polito administration is happy to fund uh, the construction of the town of Adams outdoor center, which will finally uh, realize uh, a long awaited 60 year dream, I would say, of development at the Greylock Lane. Uh, that was followed up immediately by a telephone call with our state rep, uh, State Rep Barrett, which worked hard with the administration uh, to bring the attention to the project, what it means to the town, to the administration. And we're pleased tonight to have the Lieutenant Governor with us and to have uh, the state rep with us. Uh, and with that, Lieutenant Governor, I will turn the floor over to you. It's great to have you here uh, virtually in the town of Adams. Well, thank you. It gives me great pleasure with you tonight to a good announcement to make. But first and most, I want to acknowledge uh, the work of you, uh, Towner, uh, Jay Green, as well as members of the Board of Selectmen and your delegation of letters, including uh, Representative John Baer, uh, former mayor of Adam, many, many. Uh, I am very to be joined by my colleagues in our administration, Jose Delgado, who is uh, the face of our administration uh, from Western, and Sean Pierce from DCR, who uh, has long known about 
desire uh, to see uh, this project come to fruition. Let me just start on behalf of Governor Baker, who he wishes he could be with me, but I'm really happy that I'm with you on behalf of the governor and our entire team to first and foremost say thank you. Uh, you know that Governor Baker started our service as select women and men in our hometowns. And at your room tonight, I do wish I was there with you in person, but I remember fondly, and I know he as well, our days serving active uh, boards of selectmen. If this is where the decisions are made to improve the quality of to keep your citizenry safe and to make sure the penny of taxpayer dollars is wisely used to administer great services. So I just thank you uh, to all of you for the normal course of work that you do as public officials. And just from our entire administration say thank you uh, for your incredible work over the course of this past year and through you, I wish to thank all of your uh, public officials from all of your departments who have all been impacted uh, by the effects of COVID-19 over this, this past year and how grateful I am, as is the governor, that we have such strength among our local officials uh, throughout our cities and towns of our Commonwealth to have been able to deliver services communicate with residents and to reassure them that government would work for them. So it's been an incredibly challenging year <clears throat> with a lot of darkness and sadness and heart heartache for a lot of people, for a lot of small businesses. And I just wanna thank you for being our partner and working so hard uh, throughout this year, coming out on this end of it I also wanna thank you for doing your part uh, to help people get vaccinated, uh, accessing uh, the resources that are available uh, in your county. You were a leader in Berkshire County uh, about how to uh, collaborate regionally uh, to make sure that the people of your county would, could access the vaccines. And as you could see, the president uh, President Biden yesterday acknowledged the work of our Commonwealth in leading in a vaccination effort, getting uh, people uh, connected to the vaccine. We have a little over 3 million people fully vaccinated in the Commonwealth, another million people who've received one shot like me that are plugged in uh, to get their second dose. And by the end of the month, early June, we will reach our goal of 4.1 million people fully vaccinated. And it didn't just happen without a whole lot of effort in strategizing and you know relentlessness uh, with our local officials. And I just wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, how much I appreciate you. And I know the governor does as well. Let's finish strong. Let's make sure that everyone who's eligible gets it. We've got now 12 plus to 15 eligible and connecting people over the course of these upcoming weeks uh, to the vaccine be critically important to continue to reopen and get back to the, the normal that we all love so much. I want to come tonight with some good news for you. <laughs> it's, it's been such a hard year to be able to share this with you in person. Uh, let me acknowledge Representative Barrett because you know I know you were mayor for 26 years in North Adams, you think about your region, it wasn't just your community. And I remember when the governor and I were campaigning way back uh, in 2014, coming in hopefully to office, you were talking about Greylock Glen then, and you continue to be a leader and uh, advocate for this project. Advocate is a soft word because at every turn, uh, you would, no matter what we were talking about, you would somehow weave in the, the importance of Greylock Glen. It could be for a completely unrelated issue, but you'd always finish with, don't forget about Greylock Glen and how important this is to our community, to our region, and this part of our Commonwealth. Uh, you clearly are stewards of an amazing natural asset, and we thank you for that, and you've done a lot with 
uh, the area uh, with trails and amenities that have welcomed people from all over to see the beauty of the area in which you live and which you work. Uh, we also know that there's more that we could do to make it an attraction uh, for more people to see. And if there was ever an exhibit A uh, to why uh, the state should fund further amenities there, it clearly was this past year that people needed to find places to go with their families for well-being, to just connect with nature, to escape the challenges associated with COVID-19 and to be able to go to such beautiful places right there in your backyard uh, was a real release and a real sense of support for a lot of people. And you didn't really need to go too far to convince the governor and I uh, that this was something we really needed to do. Uh, but we finally were able to find a way and we're very pleased to be able to commit $6.5 million to seeing Greylock Glen's full mission uh, with your, your education center and the amenities that you've been planning for and talking about for a long time come true. And I just thank you for not forgetting how important this asset was to not only your community, but to the region, to our Commonwealth, and for the time in which we lived, lived for many people to come in our future and enjoy. And I cannot wait, and I know the governor feels exactly the same way, to come there personally and be with you. Hopefully we can do that in June and then with a groundbreaking somewhere around August to mark these moments in person, in real time, to really demonstrate the full commitment of getting this done. It's a treasure as it is, but it will be more of an asset for your community, for your economy, and for enjoyment for many people today and for our future. And I just wanna thank you, uh, your small town of Adams being such a sort of, you, you, you hold this asset in your hands and to be able to continue to do your work and to advocate for this and push for it uh, on behalf of the people of your community and the region uh, is a real credit to you. So thank you, all of you. And thank you, Representative Barrett, for keeping your, your shoulder behind this effort all the way. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Turn the floor to the man of the hour, Rep. Barrett. Lieutenant Governor, I, uh, this is just so special. I can't even tell you, I get emotional. <laughs> but, um, we have gone through some difficult times and I think I've been in public office through most of them. And um, it was a guy named Charlie Baker who was working in the wealth administration way back when, who was the guy who has his fingerprints on mass mocha. And I think to have the governor today, Charlie Baker is gonna have him, his fingerprints on a project which I, which I consider to be as, as important to this area as mass mocha. It is a credit to the administration. You didn't hang up on me on several occasions, um, <laughs> which I probably would have hung up on me. Um, and um, you, you came through when it counted. And most importantly, not everybody was in favor of this project in Boston, as you well know. And, um, but you listened and the governor listened and you heard what we had to offer here and how important it was to our economy. You are part of what we consider to be that new economy out there, and that's outdoor recreation, which is going to be so important um, throughout the New England area, and especially in rural areas like the Berkshires. And we're going to see growth in jobs, and hopefully the broadband will continue to grow and improve here, and we're going to see many important things. So I thank you, uh, and I hope you will extend to the governor our thanks, and my thanks certainly for doing this and uh, we fully expect to see you out here. I will just tell you one quick story that the governor said to me on the phone the other day. I said to him, I said, Governor, this project is gonna to be to this area what Mass Mocha was some 30 years ago. 
And he says to me on there, he says, weren't you the same guy that said you wouldn't go across the street to see that art? And I says, yeah, I'm the same guy. And they're probably the same guy too. They will probably not be on those trails too often, <laughs> but there will be hundreds of thousands of people who will come here and uh, share this beautiful uh, mountain and area that we have. And uh, so thank you again, without rambling on too much. And uh, I, I, and to Sean, Sean's been terrific. Jose's been terrific. The whole team, the secretary has been terrific. Katie has been wonderful. And, um, and we've got more trips for her planned out here so we can build and expand upon this in, in the weeks and months ahead. So thank you very much. And Lieutenant Governor, I wanna introduce you to Donna Season. Donna is our recently retired and recalled uh, 18, 19, 20 year community development veteran. And as the rep said, and as, as you spoke about, but the project took a lot of visioning and took a lot of collaboration uh, building in order to get to this point today. So uh, we just wanna introduce you to Donna. Donna, I'm sure that there's something you probably wanna say about this project, but we're here today because of all the legwork, all the background that, that Donna did in, in bringing all different parties together and making this a project that the community stands behind. So Donna. Thank you. Um, this, we're very proud of this project. Um, we've worked very hard. Um, this project is a result of a lot of collaborations with regional institutions, um, but with a, a, a many state agencies as well. And it, it does my heart good that we are all working together, that you um, have embraced our vision for this property and what it can do for the town and this region. And um, I am deeply, personally, deeply, deeply appreciative and certainly the town. Um, we've all worked hard for this and, and we are extremely grateful to the administration and um, Representative Barrett, who has clearly been our champion on this project. So thank you, thank you very much. Donna, I've heard, <laughs> I've heard a lot of great things about you, Donna, and I know you had a lot to do with this. And um, there's something about the water out there. You're just not, you were not gonna let this go. And yeah. I'm glad that you didn't. Thank you for your leadership and your perseverance. I can't wait to see you with the governor when we come out next. Look forward to it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Yeah, and thank you, Lieutenant Governor. And please pass our thank yous on to uh, the Governor, Governor Baker. Um, we know you're on a very busy schedule. We uh, don't want to keep you any longer than we have to, but we're very excited in our community. And I'll just, just one quick thing. I, I'm sorry, but I, I went back into the, as a kind of historical guy, local guy here. I went back into the uh, local newspaper, and it was back on April 23rd, 1971 that the first article um, that was uh, documented to uh, discuss the, the last feasible, well, it wasn't feasible, but the last project uh, that was done up there. So it's almost been 50 years to the day that, we had, that our community has been waiting for this moment. And many people that show up never given it up and it's really, it really means a lot to this community. So thank you very much. That's the point, you never gave up. Right, you believe in yourself, you believed in this project, and it's more than a project. It's for decades and decades to come and generations to come to enjoy it. I just wanna thank all these board of selectmen members. It was a busy time of year with budgets and town meeting and everything else. And to your predecessors from then to now uh, for making this possible for us to partner with you on. Again, I. We are so excited to come out and visit you. <laughs> we have been uh, so focused like you on helping people be safe this past year. It will be a very pleasurable opportunity for, for us to come out, I hope in June, to get this process started in person. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Bye, Rep. Barrett. Thank you. Good night, everybody. I just want to say a few more words before I leave. I cannot thank the selectmen enough for keeping this so quiet because we have faced so many disappointments over the years. I was just afraid something was going to go wrong. It just, you know, we went through with Northern Adams and, uh, and I don't want any more disappointments, but I thank you for um, listening and, you know, hanging in there through this because I'll tell you, 
there's a lot of people that aren't with us today that used to sit in those chairs. Mm -hmm. And I can remember the first time I came here, I think was in 1990 to speak as mayor of the city of North Adams on behalf of this project. And, um, and I believe in this project and you all believe in it. And, uh, you know, uh, it's nice that I, you know, I praised all this, but a couple of times you wanted to give up on me and you did. And I appreciate that very, very much. And you hung in there and Donna, what can I say about uh, the job that you've done? Um, but the problem now is the next eight weeks are gonna be tough um, to make sure that uh, that groundbreaking comes in, in August because I think it's like an election, uh, a campaign. Running for office is easy. Uh, governing is difficult. This is now the hard parts behind us and it's gonna get harder as we move ahead, as we, you have to be the, you were the stewards of this, uh, this project and making sure that it gets done and the, and, and the best words I can leave you with, never sell yourself cheap. And you didn't throughout this process and continue to be that way. And I'll tell you, you're gonna build a fine project and the community will grow with it. And to the administrator, Jay Green, I can apologize a hundred times for the screaming I did at him during this process. But, uh, um, um, but he, he hung in there and, uh, and I'm sure he will be a good steward too along with Donna and making sure that uh, we're back here in just over a year, uh, opening up this uh, um, great building and this great project and getting it going. And in the meantime, going ahead and looking for the rest of the project to be finished as we go to the next step. We can't stop the momentum. So good job. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Good job. Thank you. Uh... Representative Barrett, I just want to make something quick um, with John that when he was running for the state rep position, it was an informational session down at uh, the county fair, and we listened to all the candidates. We had a large contingent of Adams leadership there, and um, and the question was asked, John, what is your top priority? Um, if you are elected to this position, and without hesitation, was the Gray Life Glen. And then shortly after that, the town of Adams voters supporting, supported him overwhelmingly. Um, so um, I know over the last few years, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, um, we may, I don't think there was any doubt, you know, it's just been 50 darn years, but uh, I don't think there's a lot of doubt, but uh, we really put our faith behind you and working together as a team and, and just getting to this evening. It's just fantastic. We're excited. I know we know there's a lot to work to do, and, and, and poor Tom has got, got a lot to do. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, to the representative, thank you very much. It would not have happened without you and without the whole team working together. So thank you. Okay, are we good to move on? Yeah, I think so. Why don't we just take a brief recess? We'll let our uh, Yes, uh, exit, and we'll get the tie-in bond crew uh, queued up. Okay, uh, five-minute recess. I'm going to leave it unmuted in the video. Okay. <laughs> Most of the team, uh, Miles, I think, is signed in, but I'll just check. Thank you. I know I know this is our yes. Yeah. So it'll be like a yeah. 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 so 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 yeah, it's yeah. 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 Yeah.
session uh, on the getting back to the original agenda under new business we have review of the wastewater treatment plant um cip uh improvement might be that acronym again capital, capital improvement thank you i spent the committee for 10 years capital improvement <laughs> plan and enterprise fund projects with ty and bob jay thank you uh mr chairman so as you may recall, I believe the last time we met on this was uh, we had a remote workshop meeting in February. We specifically at that time were talking about the enterprise fund uh, mechanics, but we also had a meeting, I believe, in late summer, early fall, maybe August or September, where the time bond engineering team was also reporting back on what they found on their plant assessment. So to bring everybody up to speed, where we are this evening is Time Bond has identified about $5.5 million worth of capital improvements that the plant is needed. Uh, and that's what is the larger uh, handout that you received, actually July 29th, thank you, the date's right on there. Uh, from the July 29th handout, all of the board members had that at that meeting. Uh, it's been reissued for everybody. That gives you the snapshot of what we're talking about on the campus side. That led us into a, a conversation that we've been having in the ensuing months. What is the best way to pay for these improvements at the, at the plant? And then part of this conversation has also been the need for the town to adopt an enterprise fund, which means that that is a specific account for the purpose of spending money on the wastewater plant. That's what the February meeting was about. Tonight, um, fortunately, uh, the the team is uh, shallow, so I've asked Tana to be the project manager uh, on, on this. This involves some complicated, uh, just some complicated maneuvering. It's nothing that we haven't done before, but I've asked her just to, to kind of run point on this for me because there's been a variety of moving targets. So I'll ask Donna just to, to get everybody up to speed. All we're doing tonight, very simply, is asking for a consensus from the board to move ahead uh, with access, accessing funds from the state revolving fund. That is the premier uh, funding source for wastewater treatment plant projects. And in order to do that, we have to have authorization from the selectmen and from town meeting in order to do that. And uh, we need to have that conversation tonight from the board to ensure that you would like us to continue on that, that roadmap. Um, now is frankly a good time to do that considering the uh, interest that's coming from the federal government regarding wastewater and water infrastructure, uh, money is available. So Donna and Miles, if one of you want to start, I'm giving you the bigger overview picture. I hope I wasn't unmuted, but uh, Miles or Donna, if you want to take it from, from there. Yeah, please. Sure. So thank you for having us here tonight. Um, I'm excited because following up on your previous agenda item, we have other grant opportunities for you. And uh, the biggest one is this uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrades. It's a treatment plant itself and then two pump stations as well that we went through back last year. We've been working with Jay, um, um, Mr. Tober on, um, on what should be covered under the inspection, what was, what was then done uh, as far as condition assessment goes. And then we tiered it all up in that, and you have that handout we're talking about handout because that's easy to read compared to the little one I brought tonight. Um, 
I have on the on the uh, Zoom here with me up on the upper right is Chris Bone. He would be the project manager for this um, project for Time Bond. He was involved in your planet years ago when he did the latest upgrade as well um, for um, parts of the system that needed upgrading then. That was essentially a partial upgrade and the, it was staged to have this project come in in the later years. Um, so Chris isn't gonna go through all that presentation unless you want him to explain any parts of that uh, that you have questions on. Otherwise, he's gonna give you a high level uh, total cost picture and the schedule for the SRF funding, of which you're entitled right now, it looks like you're gonna be getting a 9.9% loan forgiveness on that loan. So it's a low interest, interest loan with 9.9% of that being forgiven. That could go up if we're optimistic with the infrastructure program coming in the future. So Chris? I'm oh, sorry. If I may just interject, yeah. just as a, as a way. So Time Bond working with the town for what the past year, um, they've done a really good job, in my opinion, of, of positioning the town so that we can take advantage of kind of the best funding source in town. Um, they have um, worked with us to um, get us grant funding for an asset management plan, not only for um, wastewater, but also stormwater. Um, you know that the town is now under the MS4 program. So this asset management plan, which we will be performing um, um, over the next year, that will, um, again, help us implement these, these two, in these two areas. But importantly, because of the asset management funding that they've helped us obtain, they've also helped position the town on the list for the state revolving fund. And that's critically important in terms of giving us the best deal in town for how to fund these big improvements. But as Miles was saying, it's not only funding um, the big, bigger part at 2%, um, two I believe, but then we're also, we have, um, the 9.9% uh, of the capital part of that 5.5 million, just forgiven right from the start. So I, it's, I just think we're in a very critical point right now to, to really take advantage of, of going forward. And um, with that, I'll just get it back to you. Right, so actually um, we're talking about maybe Dan going first and talking about the SNS. Yes, that, 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 would that be good. kind of leads the storyline. Yes. If, if that's okay. Sure. There are two different system programs, both of them MassDEP, um, governed by their, their ones under the SRF program, and one is under the asset management grant program, both under DEP. So maybe Dan will switch it up. Sorry, Dan, if you could give us a recap of the asset management program. Looks good, Dan. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you all for, for having us on this evening. Nice, nice to see everyone. I'm Dan Roop with Tie and Bond project manager and asset management technical specialist. So, you know, starting almost almost a year ago, we started working with um, Mr. Kober at the, at the town to apply for an asset management planning grant, which is funded through SDEP and the Clean Water Trust. Uh, just last month, the IUP, the intended use plan was finalized. And this is through the same program, Clean, Clean Water SRF. Um, this, is, this is a grant and the Town of Adams Sewer and Stormwater Asset Management Plan was ranked number one on that list, which is which is really impressive of, of 16 other projects. So you're you're being awarded a $60,000 grant um, to come towards this $100,000 valued project. Um, they're awarding you $28,000 in, in in-kind services. So working with, with Robert and, and his team and <clears throat> Don and everyone in town that will help make up the in-kind services over the next year and a half or so. And then there's a $12,000 cash match. So really for, for $12,000, you're, you're getting a $100,000 value project. And some of the, the high level goals as you can, can see here is expanding the sewer and stormwater um, GIS database and you know really focusing on, on stormwater as, as Donna mentioned, supporting your MS4 uh, stormwater compliance requirements um, and replicating the, the efforts that, that Chris and his team did at the wastewater treatment facility at your, your other wastewater assets and your stormwater assets, um, condition assessments, and then prioritizing improvements. Uh, 
um, and really, as we like to think about it, um, defendable risk-based capital planning. So considering how likely an asset is to fail, and then if it does fail, what is the consequence of that failing? Are we talking, you know, streets flooding? Are we talking, you know, backups in, in downtown areas? Is it impacting um, fire routes, bus routes, schools? Um, it's, it's a really, really good, good exercise. It's risk-based capital planning that, that will be funded through the project. And these, this is just a brief overview of the, of the tasks that we'll be performing, helping with some administration and project kickoff, helping with a local service workshop for the town, building inventory and the, the sewer and stormwater inventory in GIS. You already have a nice robust GIS system, but we'll be taking that to the next level and adding additional um, asset data, developing you know, useful life, how long are your assets gonna, going to live, of coming up with replacement costs, putting this all together in a plan, um, working with, with our uh, rate specialist, Mike Schrader, who will be speaking later to see how these um, recommendations might impact your rates and if there do need to be any, any adjustments at the end of this uh, process, and then helping you identify some asset management software, hardware, such as tablets that you, know, you can do some, some field work, placing paper forms with, with some newer technology, um, helping come up with some work orders to help help Robert and his team better manage and plan for um, maintenance activities and op operations, and then educating you all and and the community on on these these updates and improvements. And my last slide um, is just a brief overview of the schedule. So this this has been in the works for quite a while. We submitted the application back in August, but 2020. Even before that, we, we worked with the town to get letters of recommendation, scoping all of this out. So we're very appreciative of, of the, the town's time helping put that together. We just found out last month about the intended use plan. There's some, some paperwork that needs to take place before we can get, get rolling. Um, as was mentioned earlier, that assurance of local funds, um, we'll be submitting that to, to DEP with the town, hopefully by the end of, of June is our target. And then the more comprehensive financial application will go in in October, and then we'll we'll kick things off in in November, and then we anticipate um, completion the, the latter part of summer 2022. So that's a, a, a high level overview of, of the asset management planning grant. It, it's it's a separate project from from what Chris and, and Miles will be continuing to talk about, but they they are connected at the same time, right? It's all sewer ass assets, wastewater assets, and just you know, helping to replace a reactive maintenance approach with a, a proactive one, and then determining how are we going to, to prioritize and, and fund this moving forward. So any, any questions on the, on the program? No, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Good. Great. Well, thank, thank you all again. Appreciate your help putting the application together. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. So that, that approach of looking at uh, what assets are critical and are viable to keep your system running is the same approach we took to your plant itself to come up with this package. It's the same methodology, which is endorsed by the state at a high level. And they, they really are driving this methodology down for all the towns to use. And it helps you get better funding in their, in their opinion because you're organized. You have priorities as to where you want to spend your dollars, and then they can help with the uh, loans and grants to help you fund dollars. So, so that kind of gives us the roadmap as to how we're going to spend the money that we are able to obtain from the state revolving fund. And the conversation we had last summer was participating in the asset management plan program leverages us as a community in order to get access to that funding because it is very competitive, which I'm sure Miles will go over. I was actually quite surprised at how competitive yeah. that is. Yeah, the ask management grant program, you rank number one out of the 16 applicants on the SRF application. I don't think I have those numbers. You were in the bottom half and there were a number of towns that did not get the, uh, did not get listed on the intended use plan. So it's a good opportunity and I think I don't know, listening to Bloomberg news the last couple of days, it sounds like interest rates 
on the open market might be going up. So I think locking in these rates now is probably a good thing. Uh, I do have, Chris is going to cover just a couple slides here, not that whole deck, unless you want to have questions. So a couple of new slides from that deck are right here. Um, it's a summary of the uh, cost and the schedule for this project. What was the planetary that enabled us to get number one? What was, what was the... I think it was a um, combination. A few different things. And Dan, can you give you a more, of a more of a breakdown? But it was the fact that you had both storm and sewer in the study. Uh, some communities went in with just storm or just sewer or just water. And having two uh, services that you offer the town uh, combined in one study bumps you up quite a bit. You also, because we met with Jay and Mr. Tober, we went through and, and filled out all the requisite backup, which was we had to have 10 members of your staff talk about how they're going to participate in the plan, use the GIS and the tables of information at the end of the day in their in their in their business and practice and their work. And they had a testimony, they had to fill out testimonials and sign them that they are willing participants of the process. And a lot of communities couldn't pull all 10 people together in their organization to do that. So that took a few days to wrangle the troops, right? Yes. <laughs> but that, just those 10 pages got you 10 points out of six or so. It was right. pretty right. it, was, it was significant. The, the, the participation was was huge. And, and we we worked with, with Mass DEP on helping develop and, and scope out this this program the grant program and and the rankings and and we we know it's critically important to them to have community buy-in it, it's not um, one one operator staff that's that's applying for this it it has buy-in at all because press asset management isn't a report that's going to sit on your shelf it's a it's a you know operation maintenance philosophy a, a way of life you're constantly updating it um, you go out, you make a water main or a sewer uh, line replacement, or you clean a, a catch basin or inspect a culvert. All of that data is captured, you know, real time and and lives in this database forever. It's not institutional knowledge in, in someone's mind, and when they retire, it, it goes away. It's a part of the, the town's database forever. Um, so they they want really want to see that that buy in, but what you did, that's why you scored so high compared to everyone else was the level of engagement from the town. People. One last question before we start. I'll just hand up the state. Thank you. What is, given the fact that this plant is, the, the basic technology is 50 some odd years old, the new regulations coming down the pike in terms of the, the right. standards that must be met. Right. I just want to be sure that we're not investing in technology that may be obsolete because right. of future standards. Right. If you could just and Chris, if you heard that, you can elaborate on that more. But like yeah. the, key, um, the key element of your plan that gives you a lot of latitude to meet tighter permits in the future are your aeration basins to be upgraded and running efficiently okay. so you get good air distribution and mixing, and then uh, your final clarifier. Uh, if the final clarifier system is not working well to settle out the particular matter that's, right. that's created during the biological process, you're going to have exceedances of your permits. And going forward, as you get tighter for nutrients, you need that tank. And that's, those two tanks are at the heart of this improvement package. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Did I say that right, Chris? You, you did, Miles. Yeah, I'm on board with that. The, um, the only thing I would say, like, I would reiterate what Miles said, that this plant is oversized compared to what it would need to be for the flows that the town has today. You know, this was built 50 years ago or, or, or whatever, um, back when Adams had a, you know, a significant mill um, presence, there was a lot more wastewater. And this was built assuming uh, that there would be additional population growth and additional industrial growth in Adams that, that wasn't realized over the years. So it is, you know, the tanks are oversized, like Miles said. What that allows the town to do right now is to comply with a pretty stringent limit for phosphorus. Um, that's a that's a an important nutrient that DEP regulates. Um, if they lower the phosphorus limit, you've got a limit now that's around 0.4 milligrams per liter. If they lower that down to something less than that, like a 0.2 or a 0.1, I would I don't believe you'd be able to meet 
um, uh, that limit with with the system that you have. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't do this project. What it, that would mean would be you would still have to do everything in this project, but in the future you might have to build uh, what would be called the tertiary treatment system. You know, essentially like some sort of advanced filtration system to remove that additional phosphorus. There's been no discussions by the regulators to um, give Adams a lower phosphorus limit yet, but um, they they always tend to surprise towns and 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 evaluate lower limits. Uh, so it's I'm not saying you're not going to get one in the future, um, but there's nothing here that would preclude you from um, doing that future project, and none of the money that's spent here would be wasted. We saw just as as reference. Uh, we went to the Pittsfield wastewater treatment plant where they are building a tertiary system. And although mechanically impressive from an infrastructure standpoint, the cost is frightening. Uh, but it is what it is. And, and that's one of the things that we keep our fingers crossed for with our plant, that if we're able to maintain it in good, efficient operating capacity, we'll be able to meet those, those permit standards because the cost of updating this plant at about $5 million versus building the third third level uh, filtration before discharge. I don't want to... <laughs> well, Pittsfield, that's about $65 million. Yeah. But that's if their flows are 10, 15 times your flows. And, and um, they got land constraints there. They got low-lying areas. They got difficult soils to build their plant in. Uh, all the geotech was very costly there, actually. Uh, if if you had to build a tertiary system here, it might approach $10 million though. Like it's, it would, it'd still be a major capital uh, investment. So, you know, knock on wood, that low level phosphorus limit does not come for the town because it would be a significant impact for sure. Um, and, and just tagging onto that because it's relevant to the future. Um, is there, what's the source, if phosphorus is the highest risk, what's the source of phosphorus can, and can we do supply side regulation to actually keep that crap out of the, it's a technical term. Yes, <laughs> to, keep the, <laughs> to keep the crap out of the crap, yes. Um, there's, phosphorus is natural, naturally occurring, you know, it's it's in so many different, um, different products, you know, it's in cleaners and things like that, that people are discharging to the wastewater system. Um, there might be low levels of phosphorus in uh, in your drinking water used for corrosion control. But so sometimes you could talk about controlling that, but by and large, the vast majority of phosphorus is just inherent in, in wastewater. Um, source control would be very difficult to do. And yeah, I, I just, people have looked at that. It's never really a viable option to get down to the levels that we'd be talking about. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Miles, do you want me to step through the first couple of slides of the presentation and we can go from there? Uh, yeah, just the first, the, the, just the four slides and then if there are any questions. Yeah, absolutely. This, to follow up on what Jay was saying previously, this is um, essentially an identical presentation that we gave to the Board of Selectmen in, I, it was late July of 2020. Um, we had spent the first half of, of 2020 doing a detailed evaluation of the wastewater treatment plan and the pump stations evaluating you know capital needs safety needs uh, electrical improvements all those sorts of things developed a report with a list of re recommendations um, some of which we classified as uh, you know near-term or important rec recommendations that are are listed in this um, you know proposed capital upgrade plan and then there were some other longer term recommendations that aren't included in this plan at this stage um, so so that was the basis for for what is leading us to the, the, the where we are today at that July 2020 meeting, um, the board did authorize Ty and Bond on the town's behalf to submit an SRF application to apply for the SRF funding. So we submitted an application following that meeting in August, and then um, you know the town uh, you know happily found out that they were were awarded the SRF um, uh, funding for the project. So now we're in the next step about making sure that you act uh, on that funding as required by the various deadlines. Um, so. Um, project scope, very briefly, um, 
you know, this is the treatment plant on the right side. I, I upgraded this slide a little bit from what, what uh, Miles handed out, just to give a, a sense on the type of things that are being touched in the project. You know, again, this is a, a facility that was upgraded in 1968. Um, in 2006, uh, there was a $2. million project that was done at the treatment plant. That was a limited scope project that really only addressed equipment in about half the, half the facility. And we didn't touch really any of the pumps at that time. Um, I'm not saying there weren't more needs in 2006. There was just a financial decision made that the town drew a line in the sand and said, this is what we're going to do. This is as much as we could spend at that time. So, so some equipment was replaced. The rest of it has just been maintained through the town's, you know, you know, you know, strong maintenance program for the last 50 years and is still largely original. And, uh, you know, frankly, at this stage has, you know, served the town well, but is uh, well past its useful life. Um, so the project of scope includes replacing one of the two clarifier mechanisms, the one that wasn't replaced in 2006, upgrading the second half of the aeration tank, the half that wasn't upgraded in 2006, whole variety of pump um, uh, replacements and improvements, um, improvements to the headworks and grit handling system, that those systems are um, original and definitely need improvement. Um, there's a chemical room that stores uh, chlorine and that, that's a very corrosive chemical. And that room has got quite a bit of corrosion. The equipment has served its useful life and you know, due to corrosion and difficult service really needs to be upgraded. Uh, motor control centers are the electrical switch gear that controls distribution of electrical equipment um, throughout the plant. Those are all original um, MCCs. Um, at this stage, you know, they're, um, you know, they're just not reliable anymore. They're uh, potential safety hazards associated with those um, just aging condition. They really do need to be replaced. Absolutely. You know, it's a small amount of HVAC improvements in the admin building. Um, some minor improvements to the industrial and domestic pump station. And then a, a pretty significant part of the project is safety improvements throughout that you've got a bunch of tanks at this plant that don't have handrail adequately around them. You've got concrete knee walls that are only a couple feet high. You can see actually in this picture here, you've got a lot of things like this. You know, this is a tank that's filled with wastewater. On the other side, there's an empty tank. You know, that's a 20 foot fall. You know, and you've got a number of places like that where there's safety hazards that do need to be addressed. So that's the core scope of the project. It's just a, a bunch of miscellaneous tasks that would bring this plant back up to, you know, really, really, really where it needs to be. Um, a number of these have been flagged by DEP in the past. I would say just, you know, they, they know that you've got only one reliable clarifier and a second clarifier that's, you know, just band-aided together, you know, at, at this stage. So, you know, so they're, this is something that's on their radar that is a vulnerability for the town that, that they've, they've flagged in the past. Um, schedule, um, I'm gonna talk about today. Um, there's a couple critical dates on this schedule that, that the Board of Selectmen needs to keep their eye on. Um, you know, the first is that, um, I guess I'll start with, I'll start with this second one first. Um, the, the town um, uh, has to have a bond vote um, to approve funding for this project by June 30th, 2021 to remain eligible for SRF uh, financing. So that is a critical can't miss uh, deadline that, that the town needs to keep absolutely on your radar in the next month and a half year to, uh, to make sure that vote happens. Um, the next critical deadline would be a submission to Mass DEP by what's called the uh, Part A loan application by October 15th of this year. The biggest part of that application is we need to submit design plans and specifications for the project by that October 15th deadline. Um, so going back to this first one, you know, that really means that we need to be starting with design, you know, as soon as possible. This is a significant design effort. Um, and to make sure that we've got a credible submission in by October 15th to keep the town eligible, we really do need to be starting with design. Um, you know, as soon as possible. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of work there to, to hit that October 15th deadline. Um, you know, presuming the town goes ahead, we submit um, by October 15th, DEP will issue what's called a project approval certificate. Um, they promise by the end of the year, sometimes that trip, you know, slips a little bit into the beginning of the next year. But, you know, ideally by the end of the year, they would issue that project approval certificate. Um, at that point, you're authorized to go to bid 
Um, bidding could happen anytime after they issue the project approval certificate. One potential challenge here with the late start, um, frankly, in the design is we might not be 100% design done with design by October 15th. So there might be some carryover. So just for this schedule, I indicated we're going out to bid on April 20, April, in April 2022. It could be earlier than that, but sometime around then. Um, we would be submitting uh, an authorization to award to DEP, which is called the Part B application after you receive bids from contractors in May, and then awarding in June of next year. This is another can't miss deadline for the SRF funding program. You need to submit your, um, or you need to have issued a notice to proceed to contractors by June 30th of 2022. So there's really three deadlines in here that, that we need to focus on. That first one, June 30th, 2021, for the bond authorization, the October 15th deadline for the uh, uh, loan application, along with the design plans and specifications, and then having that contractor um, with an agreement in order to proceed in place by June 30th of next year. Um, you know, provided that all goes forward, um, you know, you know, payments are starting in you know summer 2023 um you know the construction would start right away and the project would kind of roll from there um, hey chris would you say when you say payments in the summer of 2023 are you talking like july and august because you have srf deadlines of january 15th and july 15th for starting the payments if it starts in summer of 2023 and as to the July 15th payment, then that would be fiscal municipal fiscal year 2024, correct? If you if you start yeah. if you start the project, I'll, I'll step in here and try to explain this, Chris. If you start the project in uh, summer of 2020, can you move your cursor, Chris? <laughs> 2023, um, the you pay the loan back twice a year. I think Donna. This, but right. you pay you pay the loan back in two buckets each year. Um, otherwise, they're paying your contractor on approved invoices. And that, so the first, if if um, if you if you start payments in, let's say the job starts in July, you get notice to proceed in June. July starts the job starts in July. You probably start making or the loan from the state will start making payments August, September, October. You make your first payment. January of to the state in January of 2023. January 2023. January 2023 or January 2024 if payment starts summer of 2023. Yeah, they, they start paying the contract in summer 2020. Yeah, town would have to pay the contractor in summer of 2022. That might be a typo, actually. Okay. Yeah, I think that is. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as as soon as the contractor is under contract, the town would be responsible for paying the contractor. So about six months later, you make your first payment to the state. All right. So that's fiscal year twenty three. Then we would begin payment. Yes. Yeah. And then the second payment in twenty twenty four. This is then July. This is July. Okay. Yep. That was a bad typo, Chris, to have for a municipal guy like me. Yeah, yeah no, that was a good question. <laughs> as soon as you asked, I was like, what does that mean? And so um, <laughs> I'm going to jump off schedule and just like a project, I'll go through a project cost summary. Um, there's there's two levels of costs on a project like this. You've got um, costs that are not reimbursable by the SRF program, and you have costs that are reimbursable by the SRF program. Um, so Design costs, unfortunately, are not reimbursable. That's just the way the program is structured. This is just a summary of the, the design proposal that Tie and Bond has submitted to the town um, that includes a 30% design task, a final design task. There's some minor permitting as assistance, and then there's some hazardous building materials assessment work that we need to do. Um, so this is work that we would be doing from June of of this year, ideally through, um, you know, the, the, you know, winter of 2022, you know, we, you know, before we go to bid. Um, the construction costs are all SRF reimbursable. And this is taken right out of the um, SRF loan applications. So they don't re reflect 
the actual costs you would pay. These are just estimates that are included in the SRF loan application. Um, the construction cost estimate is a little over $4 million. And then there's just uh, markups that are included in, in as part of the SRF program of 10% uh, uh, placeholder allowance for contingency and a 15% uh, placeholder allowance for uh, uh, technical services during construction. So when you go to town meeting um, to do the bond authorization, this bottom one is the one that you're uh, authorizing through town meeting. This second one, it would be a separate authorization the town would need to um, have or, or an, an agreement with time bond to have us proceed with design. Chris, in terms of the SRS reimbursable amount, with the total amount being five million forty nine thousand five, do we have to authorize that? We authorize for that total amount. And at what point does the state give us the dollar figure that they for loan forgiveness? At what point do we know that? Because if we take on that total amount, we're locked in for that total amount, paying principal, paying interest. So at what point does the state say we're going to forgive X amount of dollars? So when we actually physically bond, we have the sharpest number possible. No, oh, it's up front. It's what that is what the um, has, has always told us, and, and this is our experience with other. Um, but we should, I think, I think we should reach out to them again and say, hey, if this is the plan, Mike, what would you say is our payment plan, and and for how much? Okay. When does that nine point nine percent get recognized? But it should be applied. So that's a question that I have. Yeah. You know, so that 9.9% 9 9 .9 you mentioned? Yeah. If that's at the beginning, then when we, when we get approved the project anyways, right? We right. When we get that reimbursement, that may be more of J, where does, you know, we get the reimbursement of money, where does that go? Because uh, you already have your, your, you got your funding set, you got your payment set, now you get this reimbursement sitting here. You can't restructure your loan at that time. Where's that uh, reimbursement going to go? Yeah, you've got your loan established. They're paying the contractor from the loan, I think it's monthly, mm -hmm. monthly invoices. And then you have to pay twice a year back to start paying the loan. And, and, and I think the 9.9% comes off the first three payments. Supposed to be a reduction so, of payments. Right. So that first time we were just talking about from January of 2023 could in fact have the loan have the loan forget to built into it. And we should probably confirm that. So that we might yeah, that. that would be really helpful. Yeah. Yes. And it's not like Adam, it's not we're not the first community to utilize this program, obviously. Oh, yeah. So I'm sure that others ask. Yep. And they've done an informational session that hasn't been scheduled yet, right? We have right. And that's a great question to ask there. We can go into that session for you if you can't make it yourself. It might be by Zoom this year, probably will be. And that'll be very soon in a matter of a week or two. Oh, okay. From what I understand, it's usually in May. Okay. So. <clears throat> so, Howard, I'm going to do if you have questions on the details of what we looked at and how we came up with priorities or the estimated costs, which we use based on construction dollars this year and last year. That's how we arrived at cost. It's in the packet there. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any questions on that, we can certainly answer for you. And Chris and John have already seen all that in detail. <laughs> yeah. The general question is, when you're doing the redesign, um, how's the co operating costs going to be affected? Are we going to get a more, more efficiencies? Jay was mentioning how you're going to high, highly efficient electric motors. Um, but if we're looking at the budget, the annual budget, so we can see the operating costs go yeah. down. Yes, we can. Uh, as part of our estimating, we can do that on and projected projected cost. But we did do that and, and uh, take that consideration when we went through the upgrade process. I don't know, if, uh, Chris, if you have a sense for where the efficiencies going. Yeah, forward. it's. It's a really good question. I don't think there's going to be major efficiency savings here. You, you're going to see small pickups um, here and there, um, but like the electrical upgrades for the motor control centers, you're not going to see major efficiency upgrades with that. You know, pumps sometimes can be more efficient, but um, in the wastewater world, we actually tend to design pumps uh, in some ways intentionally to be inefficient because we've got to pass 
all kinds of solids. So we want the pumps to be really open. So it's hard to make some of that equipment efficient. So there will be small gains in efficiency, but this you're not doing this project to pick up major energy efficiency improvements, unfortunately. Let me ask a, another related question then. Um, are looking at not uh, efficiency per se, but life cycle cost. You had mentioned like the chlorine and bromine. Yep. It's highly uh, corrosive material. Uh, are there savings, long term savings to be made by in, in having different materials used to re resist the cor corrosion so the lifetime of the, of the facility will be lengthened? Right. That's everyone in particular. You look at the ventilation and make sure the yeah. ventilation is all non metallic. Right. So that lasts because that's getting the corrosive air out. Right. And the better, the better you ventilate, the longer the equipment there will last. Okay. Um, that equipment is typically, uh, first, it's mostly non metallic. Also, the tanks will be plastic. Right. Uh, right. Yep. It's the, the height, the chemical itself is just very aggressive. It, it attacks the plastic, the fiberglass, or the, or the um, polyethylene tanks, whatever you build them out of, it'll, it'll attack piping. It, so it's just a very aggressive chemical. You know, we do work hard on ventilation, things like that. And that is part of the issue in that existing space is that the ventilation um, is, a, is a weakness in there. And it's led to some corrosion throughout the space, for sure. Um, in other areas, I, um, part of that answer would be ha would be during detailed design. As, we, as we're talking with equipment manufacturers for like a clarifier or something along those lines, you know, talking about different materials of construction, you know, what the adder might be to go with stainless steel versus just conventional painted steel. Um, and then presenting that to the town thinking about, you know, how equipment has lasted in this plant, you know, historically, yeah, the plant has held up very well. You know, it's, it is a credit to the staff at the plant over the years that you've got equipment that's 50 years old and a corrosive, abrasive environment. Um, so it, the town has done, you know, an admirable job of keeping this facility operational. Um, um, just a follow -up, Chris. You know, I just want one follow up. I want to be sure that when you're when you're de deciding what equipment to buy, that one of the decision criteria is the is the um, the life cycle cost, not, not, not just the procurement, not just the capital upfront cost. Exactly. Right. Right. So there's yep. some process in place yep. for those decisions. Now, however, we do that as we time bond has a kind of a library of standards that we've developed over the years, standard specifications. Chris is one of the authors of those. Okay. And we take life cycle costs into account for those as we select different vendors or products. Like in the chemical room, the product that we'll put down to, content, to um, coat the contaminant area that right. you need by safe, for safety standards to contain right. the tank fails, it's going to hold it in the air. That coating system, for instance, we've, we've tested and tried on a lot of other projects and it's, it's geared towards a longer life. It's expensive up front. Exactly. It's not easy to apply. You have to trawl it on in some cases. Um, but it's the one that lasts the best. But but we can certainly share, you know, Robert and Jay, whoever's interested, those kinds of comparisons we're doing on certain key features. You know, uh, the, 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 prim the primary clarifiers, for instance, we looked, I think, already at stainless steel components versus painted steel. We think for you, it's painted steel. It's not going to last quite as long. But stainless steel, if you do the life cycle cost analysis, it's just hugely expensive. Okay. And going into the market now with material costs going up, right. we'll take another look at that uh, in design and see if changes have occurred. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Okay. If there's any questions anytime, I'm certainly happy to, to weigh in on this. If anybody wants to take a tour of the plant, be happy to walk down there with you and, and walk around and what, you know, whatever, whatever it takes to, to uh, keep, keep the board engaged, I'd be happy to do it. So, I would like to I, I, I need to go visit. <laughs> yeah. We're going to take Howard right down to the headworks, <laughs> see the muffin monster all the way out to the outfall, start to finish. Sounds good. Uh, no, I'd be, happy, I'd be happy to join you if you want to do that. It'd be great. Like John, do you have any questions? Uh, I, I have a few questions. Um, knowing it's budget season in the state, um, have you had any conversations about DEP's uh, funding toward uh, these revolving funds that you've been discussing? Uh, yes, that's that's at the heart of this process. We have we have um, uh, 
uh, Jen uh, is one of our engineers has been uh, sending myself and Donna information as to the, the spending plan, the, the schedule for reimbursement um, for the town back to the SRF fund. Um, those are all key to this, uh, to the success of this project. Um, DEP is very engaging. Anyone from the town can call this gentleman, Mike McGrath. He's about to retire from DEP after years and years of service. So if you want to get the biggest bang for your buck, you probably should call him before between now and like June. Um, he's very open to discussing the, 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 the way the program works, its history, the benefit it brings to communities like yourselves. Um, he's a very engaging guy. Great. I was going to say good for because I'm working for the town Adams. You can't retire. <laughs> and and uh, a few other questions. Um, I've been through the plant a number of times, and um, I too am concerned about uh, the small knee walls with no protection uh, falling into uh, the vats. Um, I'm just wondering, they've been like that for such a long time. Has OSHA ever uh, said anything about getting corrective measures for that? To, to the best of my knowledge, no. OSHA is not typically visiting wastewater plants to, to flag things like this, but it is an issue for sure at this plant. I mean, you're, you're right to be concerned about that for sure. So, and if OSHA did visit this plant, you know, and they might, if you had an accident or something like that, um, that would be when those types of things would definitely come to the forefront. So there's no one within the state that goes around and checks things to that, um, to my point. So, cause OSHA is usually federally, uh, it, it, it usually comes in with the Fed. So, in short, all of these years, there's never been a citation or anything uh, leveled against the uh, wastewater treatment plant for, uh, as you mentioned, there has not been I, that you know of? Not, not that I know of. Not that I know of. Um, okay, and uh, two other quick questions. Uh, I brought this up quite a while ago about mold. Uh, down in the basement room where um, I'm not sure what's down in there, but you can see black mold on the walls. And that was brought to my attention when I went on the tour, and that's concerning to me. And lastly, um, if we should go for a bond, uh, two questions. Uh, what is our bond rating right now? The uh, bond rating, I think, is double A minus, I believe, based on one of the two rating agencies. Uh, that was just updated, Joe, when we did the 2.5 million borrowing for the flood control infrastructure. So I believe it's double A minus the SRF, which would be the lender, uh, because there is specific state-funded uh, lender to the municipalities. It doesn't solve flat. Go ahead, Mike. It doesn't come into play, right? It's flat, right. And uh, lastly, should we go for a bond, um, how many years would this bond be for? Has that, been, um, ha has that been hashed out or is that still work in progress? You know, I knew that question might come up and I didn't have time to call. Uh, I, I really don't know for the SRF program. The last one was 20 years. 20, 20 years, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. So it's about a two and a half percent rate. You amortize that over 20 years. You take the 9.9% um, yeah. into account and you can do the, um, the, the payback crystal calculation. You working on that? Yeah. <laughs> it's HP calculator. Um, Christine, do you have any questions? I don't. Just a couple here. So you mentioned the contingency uh, when we do these projects, usually a 10 percent contingency that's built. Is that built into this, or is that something the town has to come up with that funding in case there's overruns? You, you build, you build them into the loan, so it's part of your part of your program. As we complete the design, we can revisit that contingency, but we usually recommend you you keep that in there in accordance with the loan program. Okay. Yeah, the, the, I'll add to that. The way the that's built into the SRF program during the design phase up through um, up through bidding, um, you have a 10% contingency. 
And then once you finish bidding and you have a firm bid price from the contractor, the SRF program drops that contingency from 10% down to 5%. So you would, once you have a firm bid price, you would have 5% of contingency available. It would be funded under the SRF program to fund change orders or things you'd want to add to the project, what have you, uh, throughout the construction project. Uh, next question is, is there any way to use the existing solar panel field or to add solar panels to this uh, facility, which has, does have land uh, available in, in certain parts of it? Um, is there a way that solar panels could even make a dent in the cost of operating a building like this? Yeah, and we, we looked briefly at that and didn't, um, didn't include that part as part of our report, right, Chris? No, we didn't. Um, I haven't done that analysis in a few years. The last time I did one, unless you could find a way to fund them, um, it's hard to make the economic justification work on a project like this. Um, if you can find a funding source, then they start to become, the payback starts to become more attractive. But um, you know, right now they're not included in the project. The project is really just focused on these core things that absolutely need to get done. Well, we could, if a if a solar company was interested in, you know, they could make money themselves. That'd be something that Tom would work towards. Yeah, we could. The only thing I would need Ty and Bob to with is, unbeknownst to a lot of people, when you look at the the overall footprint of that plant, there's a lot more infrastructure underground in that green grassy area. Bob and you know Walt walking on. So where what about are you talking about? Like, well, you're standing. I didn't realize that. that would be, we just need to know like what the footprint is yep. for it and how much uh, of the grids you know we could put in, what the generation is, and we do achieve some savings now um, based on our the solar field that we get the credits for. We apply a good chunk of those credits to the, the plant because that is the biggest electricity user in the town inventory. That's the only thing I learned is everything that's grass there isn't exactly open as we think. And I don't think we looked at, Chris, we didn't look at the roof loads to see if panels could go on the roof? No, I, I would think you would be okay, but we didn't look at it, yeah. Yeah, we have a small seven and a half um, kilowatt. Um, we you know, got grant funding and we did that. Um, presumably it's still working. <laughs> um, so we installed that several 10, 15 years ago. So mm -hmm. it's on there now. And my last question is that, um, so this will cost the taxpayers money to take out a bond, right? Um, we are currently paying the uh, remainder of the loan that was uh, taken out back in 19... 2006. 2006, was it? Yeah, 2006. Yeah. And, you know, a few more years ago on that. You know, this is the right time to do it. I agree. This, you know, yeah, we will have double a double loan program, which um, for a couple of years for a few years for three three, three years, years in 2025. So how do we? So that will be the major question. Uh, the town meeting uh, scenario is how are we going to pay for this? Um, so something we can think about, discuss next week or whatever. But we have to have a road to um, you know for the schools. We know exactly. How much we're paying each year, and it's less and less each year. So, we have to, there's an insight to that. Would there be something similar to this? So, from, a, from a budgeting standpoint, we'll know what we owe in fiscal year 23, 24, 25. We know now what we owe on the, the debt service for the first round of this. However, to also answer, I think, John, the second part of your question, I'll turn it back over to Miles. If Mike, the numbers guy, is uh, on. This is his. his uh, Alleywood. Right, and he's, he's up next. I, I will say that we will dig further with Mike McGrath and look at that forgiveness piece when that occurs. If it's the first year of your payments back, that helps that that double debt payoff that you're talking about for two years. It might help that first year or second year. Yes. With the new loan. Right, right. Okay. Right. So we'll we'll get you some real numbers on that. Right. Should I, I can go ahead and call them. Sure. Yeah. The only before we move on that, the only other piece that we didn't you know, the design costs, we have to come up with the funds to pay tie and bond the contract with them to do the design work. So Donna and I are continuing to have that conversation to identify where the best source of those funds are. You know, we, we have some money now. Uh, we're going to get this ARP money coming in from the federal government. We're still waiting guidance. So that's just still a big target. But we have, we know we'll have the funds. 
Well, we, we, there will be, um, it's coming very quickly because yes. it's one of possibly three or four warrant articles that you'll be voting on next week. Uh, one, you know, if I can go ahead um, for the design, what well, right now the best approach is that we would ask for uh, town meeting approval to um, for temporary use of remaining money. As you know, uh, we've set aside about 500K for the Jordan Street project. We're waiting to hear from FEMA. Um, so we think if town meeting would allow us to use those funds to get time bond going, then when the American Rescue Plan money comes, we're scheduled to get 2.3 million, um, we would use that to replenish uh, the flooding bond and, and do that project. So that would be one more in article. The second warrant article would be the bond authorization. And then as I understand from Mike, and this is a perfect segue for him, but I learned today from Mike that we also have to um, do an article approving the funding mechanism. Is it going to be the enterprise fund or some other fund similar to like revolving funds that we do? So um, so those, those three, there may be something for um, the asset management plan, but we can uh, get greater, um, you know, specificity from DEP on that, whether we need something uh, to go for it. Those first three are the big, the big uh, um, articles that we'll need. Yep. It's a good summary. Um, Mike, do you have a few slides to share as to, as to how that approach works? And what your rate, what your rate study has done so far, I have a, I had you have a handout for that because we had that meeting in February. Mm -hmm. And is Mike pulling up the slides with with the warrant article that Don had just mentioned about if it's going to be established as an enterprise fund or evolving fund? Do we have to make a determination as to whether or not that what the rate structure would be? And is I think we talked about back in February, it's like water usage. Or right. EDUs, does that have to be determined to, to do that? Should we? Right. No? Okay. We, I like that answer. That's a great answer, Mike. Thanks so much. <laughs> You're on the record no. saying such. No, so. no, sure. <laughs> It was good to see everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, it has to be determined at some point. I just, right. I didn't know if that had to happen before we vote on an enterprise fund. Right. If it can come later. That's because until this morning, we didn't necessarily think we needed to discuss the enterprise fund yet because we want to do a lot of education. On this. Correct. It's not anything that we're going to rush into. But Again, Adams is behind the eight ball because we are not structured to fund wastewater costs the way that other municipalities are. So let's say that we have been structured with an enterprise fund since you know the mid 90s, and it was time to upgrade our plan. We would only be having a conversation about the capital needs of the plan and how to go access the, the SRF to get the funds. In our situation, we are not fiscally structured correctly. We're the oddball. We may be one of two or one of three, depending upon how you look at it. But that's the problem that we have is when this D, when DEP and the other agencies look at us to work with us, everything that they give us to follow goes, well, we don't have that. We don't have that. So it's getting difficult for us to access this other, these pots of public money because we're not structured. And then that's when Mike, thanks, Mike threw it at us this morning and said, I think we need to have an authorization to show how we're going to fund mm -hmm. payment of the SRF, which makes us not be able to have that conversation in September like we wanted to have. And we still are researching that. Um, well, talking to Mary um, and Crystal this afternoon, um, there might be both alternatives coming to you um, and to town meeting. So if we, if we fail to move forward with the enterprise, then we can have the other one. If the enterprise moves forward, authorization to go proceed with an enterprise fund, then we won't need the second uh, warrant article. You know, so we're we're again trying to be strategic and, and advance this project, assuming the board supports that um, on several fronts. As I preempted everybody with, this is not a simple conversation. There's a lot of moving parts to this. 
Okay, Mike. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand out your full um, content of your presentation because some people don't have that, right? From February. Howard. Miles, while you're you're passing that out, I just I I apologize. I I have a six month old and a two year old, and I am past past due tagging in. To, to help them. So I will be available for, for asset management questions if there's follow-up. I just want to thank Mr. Green and Don and the board for your your time. And um, we will be in touch soon. I'm looking forward to working on the asset management project with you all. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Stay well. Thanks for the feedback about Polar Park, by the way. That was helpful. It, yes, enjoy. Have a great time. Yeah, great well, time. It's beautiful, beautiful park. Night, so. Electric atmosphere. It's good to hear it. Well. Thank you. How are we on time, Mr. Green? Mike, you're like the you're like the closer. So I would say you got 20 minutes, 25. You, you can go as far as a half hour. So hour you're, half you're, is you're good. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, that's true. I'm sorry. We do have another item, Mike. So keep it to like 15 if you can. <laughs> sorry. 15. Our our night's all been. You're going to get no, 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 that's yeah. fine. I just want to check in. That, I'm glad you said that because what I've done is, you know, pared down the, the full presentation um, to just some key points. And I understand you have some new uh, members. And I just want to say up front that my, uh, my role is a little bit different than the other engineering that's going to be performed for the town in that um, my goal is the, to facilitate informed decision making on your part so that the people making the decision understand what went into it, understand the, you know, the pros and the cons, the drawbacks, the advantages, that kind of thing. So I'm going to go through these slides uh, fairly quickly, but I, I just want you to know that Mr. Green can invite me back anytime that I'm not going to be really happy until I understand that you understand what we're talking about, what the decisions are, and any questions or, or ways that you need to um, be able to understand them. And I, I don't mean to sound reductive, but the you're, you're looking at something that's a cardinal change from what you're doing now. And frankly, sometimes it's hard to show what the pluses and minuses are to different um, schemes and different structures. So I have um, all the patience in the world to, to walk people through that and make sure that we understand what we're doing. So with that, I'm going to hit the high points of some slides here. And please, I, you know, the thing that makes me feel worse than anything else is a feeling like when I'm like waterboarding a board, you know, I, I don't want to rush you through something. I want you to understand it. And because, uh, because, you know, frankly, you'll have to, um, deal with your customers in your town after we put forth whatever form you're gonna use. So I just wanna you know, let people understand it up front. Um, so having said that, you can see my screen. It looks like um, this was the previous presentation in February. I didn't, I added one slide. Uh, so as we just talked about the town, we've identified 7 million plus worth of needs um, that need to be funded. You currently recoup your cost of sewer through property tax. And as a sidebar, I try not to talk out of my area, but I'm pretty sure that the requirement, this enterprise fund business is, you need to certify that you either have an enterprise fund or a, what they call a special revenue account. And I believe that that comes from um, when they passed proposition two and a half in the eighties that water and sewer would get raided because that was the source of funding. It's the only other thing in town that brings in revenue generally, except for um, property taxes. So I believe that this is the state and the, the, um, the trust protecting their interests by making sure that the revenues that you collect for your enterprise are not just getting you know lost in the general fund, that there's a, a dedicated, um, allocation or a, a fund that that money goes into. So without getting into the semantics, they're, they're basically the same kind of thing. And what I believe is that you can do anything except what you're doing now. So you can't stay as just a general, uh, general general fund where it just goes in with everything else, all the other receipts. It's either gonna be separated as 
a special revenue fund, which for the most part, you can't really tell from the outside between that and an enterprise. Um, so having said that, Adams has the ninth highest tax rate in the state, um, which has, you know, been one of Jay's concerns over time is that that, or that's what I've heard is that to continue to work on our plant and do what we need to do, we're just going to keep driving ourselves out of the market in terms of tax rates. So we need to look at some alternatives. Um, the other thing I want to bring up uh, after our conversation this morning, we were talking about the double dipping and the debt payment and such is that your cost for sewer, even though it's blended in with the, um, with the property tax, the people don't see it as a discrete bill. We broke it out because we needed to understand it in terms of comparing costs and impacts. And it's very, very low. And I, I know that's a good thing. Um, but you know, it's, it's kind of like if you went to go buy a car and someone told you that a brand new car for $6,000, you'd be kind of suspicious of why. Like, why is it that low? Why isn't it cost what the other ones cost? And so part of this is um, that I, I believe you've been underfunded. And we've talked about you maintaining this plant for 50 years and that's great. But the, the reason why these other costs are much higher is because of capital projects. And, you know, in truth, probably some uh, nutrient removals too. And that's why you've seen the cost go up. It's because as regulations go up, the cost goes up as well. But I just want to keep that in mind that, that you're at a very, very low um, rate right now. You're the fifth lowest. I looked at the totals in 2017. So um, ninth highest, fifth lowest. So you're, you're sort of like a spare. Uh, so when we look at how do we fund this, when we look at uh, funding an enterprise or a, a sewer system, I, Hold on, hold on. Hold on a second. We got a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Did I hear you correctly when you said that we may be foregoing maintenance and that's why? And, and, uh, and I won't say maintenance. Um, I would just say, uh, and this is not, I've not been to your plant. Um, it just in general, when I see two things, right? I see a project, uh, a very low rate, and I see that your only debt expires in three years. That's generally, you know, just a, a sense of where the spending has been going on capital. Um, to, to leverage off Chris's statement about chlorine being corrosive, wastewater has to be the most aggressive environment for everything from pumps and tanks to doorknobs. It just, everything wears extra hard in, in wastewater um, systems. And so you generally see a fair amount of uh, debt service and capital spending and that kind of thing. So. I am not in any way uh, indicting the, the crew or the- I don't uh, want to indict any, but I just want to understand how did we get to be fifth lowest and when, what, are the, what are we trading off to get that position? Uh, Mike, can I jump in there on that one? Please do. You, you traded off uh, redundancy. You've let basically half your plant just fall into disrepair and you've kept the other half of the plant running. You know, so the the, the the staff has done, a, I think, an admirable job in maintenance. It's just everything is really old, and they've they've half of the plant just hasn't been used, and it's just fallen into disrepair. So, so that's that's what you've given up is is redundancy, which is a significant risk to the town if anything catastrophic happened to what you're running. It's the same cost of years, but you have to do a little backup. If a piece of equipment fails, they're out there scrambling to get it back online. The same piece of equipment. Okay. But, but I think that's contributing, Mike, to the low co historical cost of sewer for Adams, right? Um, yes. I'm having a little trouble hearing people. Um, so if it seems slow, it's because I'm trying to think what you just said. But yeah, in, in general, again, looking at just the numbers, you just get a sense after I've done like 50 of these, you, you get a sense for why is that so low? Why is this so high? And, you know, what are we looking at? That kind of thing. And again, historically, that's what I've seen is it's very hard looking at spreadsheets to say whether something's funded or underfunded, but debt is always a good um, indicator. And, you know, the history of cash or capital spending is also a good indicator. So, um, so having said that, my uh, my role or my evaluation that we did 
we looked at um, three different options. Uh, one of them is this the, the do nothing is staying with the general fund or staying with the property tax because we, you want to always compare against what you're doing now as a baseline. And then I looked at two different rate structures. One is a usage based and one is a non usage based, so the EDU. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the important thing to take away is we develop a pro forma for each one of these alternatives that has. You know, the expenses at the top, the revenues below that, and then you, you live and die by the net revenue, which is how much the difference is between your revenue and your expenses. So for all three alternatives, the expenses are exactly the same. And also to be um, really clear, the entire CIP is funded, meaning that I took everything that everyone gave me and, and it's in here. So I'm not optioning, leaving things out or whatever. The only caveat to that is we were taught or as you were talking is I've got the design cost in here and I've treated this like it's an enterprise now. And because of the timing, it's um, it seems very likely that you may not be by the time you need to uh, authorize that design um, cost. Just Donna was just talking about that before. So there's there needs to be a little feathering as to how this takes off in terms of the timing and you know some of the nuts and bolts but in my opinion for all intents and purposes this does because we looked at the um that design cost under the existing property tax scheme it's included in all three alternatives it's just that once we kind of get there we might need to to just tune up some of the timing so um, and also we talked about the, um, the extra debt and in case anybody uh, is in the finance field, debt's not really an operating cost, but I include it there because that's your, that's what you're spending now. And it makes it easier for um, people to see what the change is, what the difference is. And that's what this is about. It's, it's not to sound, um, I don't know, uh, I don't know what the word is, but it's about a, your customer experience too. the people that are paying now, what's going to happen to them over time and who's going to pay more, that kind of thing. So it's important to me to start with what you have now. What would that look like? And then here's two alternatives to consider. In your case, the alternatives are really based on, um, how do I say it? The, the goal would be that under either scenario, the use-based rates, or the EDU base rates is that your customers are paying the same. The, the rub is that it's very difficult to do that. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But so what we did to start, and I've truncated a lot of these slides at, at FY25 because they just, they get hard to read if I go all the way out to 30. So we took a 10 year look and budgeted future expenses, even though this is all um, combined inside the general fund, the, um, Actually, happily, because you bill North Adams for some sewage, um, the accountant, the previous accountant, had already broken this all down. So it was much easier to start. Um, we didn't have to pull stuff out of the general fund. So anyway, we have, um, you know, what we've identified for a capital improvement project, I mean, pr not project plan, which is the big treatment plan project that we talked about some medium and lower priority improvements that we identified that are out further. Uh, infiltration and inflow, which is uh, very important and it's required, it's important and it costs you money. And then some pump station, minor pump station repairs. So moving on from that, when we talk about rate structures um, and, and this is very interesting, I think, because we're changing potentially the way that um, the variable that causes people's sewer costs to go up and go down. And, you know, the, the concept under different rate structures is you want equity, meaning that your cost is representative of the cost that you or the impact that you impart on the system. And it's sort of an unusual way of thinking about it, but to think about, you know, uh, water side, which is a little easier, if, you know, you have two houses and one to the other, and one of them has just a, a you know, an elderly couple living there and they, they don't do that much outside, whatever. Right next door is the same house. It's got a pool in the back and, you know, teenage kids with cars and they're washing their car. 
it's, it's their cost is gonna be higher because they're using more of that utility. And here with the sewer, obviously it's not quite the same, but it's very similar in that um, you have residential users, which are kind of easy to capture, but then you have non-residential, which is a trick and it's, it's very difficult. So when we talk about customer cost causation, we want it to be related to their flow, the quantity of wastewater they send you, and then the strength, which we probably won't get too much into unless you have like a brewery or something that's a, you know, a high strength waste producer. But right now, their bill, if you will, or that portion of their tax bill is only based on their property valuation, which is really interesting because it has, of all the things that you could measure, it has the least impact on how much sewage you generate. So the question is what happens when we change rate structures, when we look at rate structures? So the three basic ones, um, th there's more. Wastewater rates are generally simpler than water rates, but I looked at three and it's the general fund, like we just talked about, the billing unit or the unit of measure is your assessed value. Uh, and then the pros, it's the lowest administrative cost, right? You don't have to do anything. And the cons is it's the lowest equity between customer classes. And then you go to a usage base, which is um, based on the metered water use. And this is a you know well-adopted industry standard. Um, and the, the pros on that is it's very high equity and it's self-regulating. The, let the flow figure it out, right? If you use a ton, um, you know, after, 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 we'll talk about some of the things you need to think about. And that is like swimming pools and lawns and all that, but we can talk about that later. The cons is it requires water use data and it's, it's a higher administrative, I don't wanna say burden, but it's higher than obviously the general fund, but it also has a ramp up, right? You need to get some billing software and, you know, think about how to do all that. And then the, the, the second rate alternative is the um, what's called an equivalent dwelling unit. And even though we call it a non-usage based, it's really premised on, um, oh, actually, I think I have a slide. So these are the three schemes, do nothing, A and B. Um, and I'm going to jump right here real quick. I'll go back to it. But what this is saying is that under an EDU, you it's, it's an equivalent dwelling unit. And what that means is how many houses is a factory equivalent to? And even though it's used when you don't have uh, actual usage information, it's inherently based on an assumption of usage. So um, you would estimate how much usage this factory would use or this building would use. And you divide that by what you estimate a house would use and they would get billed at you know, um, 10 times the amount that a house gets. So that, um, like I said, that's a little bit tricky. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but what we look at is your expenses. This is the pro forma. Um, the vertical bars are the expenses for each year. And again, we look over a 10 year period because it, it gives you the best chance of um, developing a strategic plan and, you know, that kind of thing. So we look at, um, you know, I looked at the usage numbers. There's a lot of data that went into the behind. We got um, water usage from the um, from the water district. They were very cooperative and we used that to estimate uh, usage from sewer and come up with a, a rate structure that, that would work and look at the um, what the cost would be over time. And one of the things that's the primary difference with an enterprise fund is you would have uh, a fund balance, what, what they call retained earnings. So this model is a very simple checkbook approach. You know, the, the green is the revenue that's coming in, everything else is an expense that goes out. And the gold line on the bottom is your balance. Is that a question or is that just noise? Noise. Okay. Um, so what we look at is we want to get you to around a 20% fund balance. And so that would take a couple of years to build up because you don't want to just, you know, hit it really hard in the beginning. And it also depends on where some of those costs actually get paid out of. But again, right. that's-, that's now, Right now, you don't really have a fund balance like that. You're like borrowing from different lines. You have free cash. Yeah. That's what they have now in your in your uh, general fund. So 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 we build in that fund balance as part of the, the structure, part of the plan, which is a healthy thing to do, right? Right, and it, and it you know, frankly, 
I'm sorry. And, and I'm not trying to, I, it's a little hard to tell when other people are talking. So if I'm sorry if I talk over anyone, but the, the concept uh, here and the concept of the enterprise fund is it separates the expense uh, of that utility from the rest of the town's operations. And it takes that expense and applies it back to the people that get the benefit from it. And one of the reasons why you want to have that fund balance is it reduces the chance that you're going to have to hit the uh, general fund because even though we, we, you know, we talk about enterprise funds, special revenue, these SRF bonds, it's all general obligation. It is the, the town of Adams, no matter what. There is no Adams sewer LLC or anything like that. So this is designed to just separate it out. And then, you know, a counter to that is make sure that the money that you collect for sewer gets spent back on sewer and not on, uh, I always say school buses, but it's probably police cars or whatever. So once we do that, we've looked at, you know, going forward, what would that look like over time? And these little arrows are estimates at this point, what rate increases or adjustments would have to be over time. And really what you can see is those are just almost sort of uh, inflationary adjustments, but just little tweaks here and there. So we don't have to go through the numbers so much, but the most important thing that I think of for the decision makers is we're going to talk about, you know, all this engineering stuff to do with your plant and all these numbers and stuff here. But at the end of the day, what people want to know is what's it going to cost? What's it going to cost for me, for my parents, you know, whatever people that, that live in the town. And that frankly is your role is as selectmen. And so what we do is we look at, um, we look at the annual cost that we estimate for a residential user. And then um, we apply a couple of industry standard affordability metrics, because frankly, I don't want to get into any discussion of what people can and can't afford because it, it never brings out the best in people. So what we use is the standard um, evaluation, you know, that the, that the industry uses. And you can take that as uh, I call it context, right? I'm not saying yes, you can, there's not, there's always exceptions and things like that. So anyway, what we see here on this slide is we compare the three alternatives and then we compare that over time to see how that would change. And then at the end, I total them. There's really no value. This is not a metric. This is not a thing, but it's a really quick way to understand what's your impact on, um, on this residential, on this typical residential. Uh, and for typical, uh, we always show our math. So the existing is based on the property tax of an average home value, which was uh, $149,000 in 2021, escalated at a 10 year average of 1.3%, which I got from looking at your historic data. So the, um, the other part is not only do I want to make informed decisions, but I want those decisions to be transparent and data driven so that, you know, if there's a, an issue, or if someone has a question, we can show what that was based on. And so the other thing you're gonna see is that it's hard to get these to be exactly the same. And there's a number of reasons for that, but under the usage-based rate structure, it would be, um, well, you can see the numbers here, 417, 469, and 366. So over this um, seven year period, the total cost is 3,700 for the existing your property tax, 37, a little more, 48 for usage based, and then $3,000, so $700 less for a um, EDU based. But when you change everything, you want to look at more than um, residential because you hear a lot of people, especially consultants, will say, well, on average, the cost is this. And I, I can tell you, it's never the average that, that bites you. It's always the outliers. So we want to just check some of the outliers and see what are the impacts there, to, again, to help you round out um, this decision. And interestingly enough, I have the book right here is one of the manuals on rate setting. And it actually says in here, I was looking for something, and it says that the best rate structure is the one that works for the community. And that's really important because you have broad range as the water and sewer commission, or the, sorry, the sewer commission to set rates. So it's, it's not, it seems formulaic as we go through it, but when you get to the end, it's, it's what fits, what feels right for um, Adams. 
And then because of the um, affordability criteria looks at the cost of water too, it's this more holistic water sewer stormwater. Uh, we calculate the annual cost for water, which is not based on, um, that has nothing to do with you folks except for that affordability part of it. And so, like we said, well, residentials are predominantly the predominant user type, it's important to understand your other impacts. So when we look at this, um, again, you know, this is that same thing. We're talking about customer cost causation and their customer cost and how to um, relate that. So I always think these are interesting and I'm not gonna lie, this is usually what you see with an EDU system too, for somehow they always get sort of out of whack. But what we're looking at here is the amount of sewer generated or at least water used on this access and then their property value here, which is something you don't usually ever see connected, but these are your existing customers. This is the data um, that we used for this evaluation. And these two lines are, are very interesting to me in that this, this vertical line is showing um, that you have people with similar valuations. So this is all 350,000, but yet they have way different um, sewer usages. So that that's, you know, sort of a puzzler here. And then you flip around the other way and you get um, customers with almost exactly the same usage, but really different uh, property values. So this $2 million, you know, home or business or whatever it is, is using the same amount of sewage as this, you know, what must be a, a shotgun shack, a very small um, structure. And that that's a challenge from a, this equity thing. So um, I picked, I went in and picked three, uh, four um, sample customers that I wanted to examine as far as outliers go. And one is commercial, one's industrial, one is just a high usage house. And I think it's probably lawn irrigation, which is something else, you know, we'd have to talk about going forward and the supermarket. Um, I think you only have one supermarket, so it's not hard to tell which one, but I looked at what was their cost be under all three scenarios. So this um, commercial, we have the valuation, their number of usage or their amount of usage and the EDU. And the EDU was based on, um, the estimated average annual residential usage, which is the, the denominator. That's how you just determine EDUs. So in this case, this um, commercial is a small commercial, uh, I believe it was a uniform service. And under the existing structure, they're, they're not paying very much because they have a relatively low valuation but they use a, a fair amount of water. So under a usage base, they would be paying in here in the middle at about $3,600 for a year. But under an EDU, it would be much higher because of the way EDUs are calculated. And again, this is a, a, a first run through um, of, your, of your options and we could refine the EDUs uh, as we you know, get more information as we move forward. Under the, uh, for the industrial customer, again, they're paying, um, much higher because you have a split tax rate. And so they're paying, you know, $1,100 here under a usage base, they don't use much usage. So they'd pay much less under either other scenario. So I hate to put it this way, but it's, I think of it in my head as like winners and losers. And that's what you always have when you change structures. This high usage home, this is interesting too. Valuation is not that high. So his tax is not uh, very high. And under an EDU, he'd be one. That is the dwelling unit is one house. But under the usage base, because he uses a fair amount of usage, his bill would be, um, you know, three times as much. So that, that's interesting that, um, you know, how that can impact. And it's sort of what I was saying before, when it's hard to explain what these different impacts are on people, it is quite different. And then the supermarket, big valuation, um, you know, fair amount of usage and, you um, yet, uh, you know, middle of the road number of EDUs. So this is where I think the discussion happens in terms of, um, you know, when you're ready to pick a rate structure, which is how do we recover this? You know, you could, you could say, all right, everybody that's in the sewer, we're going to divide by a head count. We're going to pay, you know, based on that. There's any number of ways you could do it. And it's just finding the one that fits um, Adams. 
and I don't have the preview thing showing, so I can't see. So this is the next step is the, um, the um, affordability analysis. And there's two that uh, get used and we did not show the, um, the old fashioned one or the old guard was the, um, what they call roughly the 2% of median household value. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that, but that sometimes uses a rule of thumb. It comes from the EPA, from the um, sewer separation days and the, the you know protest the cost of environmental programs. More recently, um, because of concerns that the median was the worst thing to look at and not a good measure of household costs, they um, introduced this new, more sensitive uh, factor and it's called the household burden indicator which basically takes the cost of water, sewer, storm water, divides by that lowest 20%, the lowest quintile, and then applies that as an index. And then you look at the percent of your community that is living below 200% of the federal poverty level, which again is another index that they use for things like, you know, school aid and stuff like that. So it's just another common piece of data that you can get. And what you do is you enter these two things in this chart and, or I'm sorry, down here in this rubric here, and that gives you an idea. Again, I'm not gonna say, yes, it's affordable, it's not, but what it tells you is what they consider to be a low burden to a very high burden. And I looked at that over time and um, what we also do is I don't change the income over time um, for the projections, I leave it state, you know, where it is, and that was in 18, because it's the most conservative. Um, you could justify increasing it at, you know, at least 1% a year. Long story short, um, under all three scenarios out at FY30, it's predicted to be, or it's, I'm not sorry, predicted, it's uh, considered to be a moderate to low burden. The reason it's not low, interestingly enough, is it's because your prob I can never say this poverty prevalence indicator is 28%. So you're in this middle, um, this middle tier, and no matter what you're charging for SOAR, you're already starting at moderate low, and that's why you're in the lowest. So you're in the lowest category as far as that household burden goes, uh, except I'm sorry, this one here is 7.2. It's just over that. Um, but it's uh, lower the whole rest of the way. So the takeaway is that yes, with the double dipping, with this project, with the design, with all this other stuff, it's not considered to be um, an economic burden. And, and that's based, this data is for Adams. It's from the census. It's, you know, it's, it's here, it's not national or that kind of thing. And I think, okay, so one more slide and then we can rewind if you want to ask questions. Four conclusions, um, sewer costs are artificially low, just showing this is the average. And this is another teller, this is where your water is. Sewer costs way more than water does generally because it just, it's, you know, has a lot of extra steps and a lot of infrastructure. Um, by going to one of the two alternatives, you can lower your um, tax rate. And we estimated that it would go from 9th to 33rd. Um, and interesting looking at that, there's a couple Berkshire towns that are way up at the top. And it's, it's you know, as you know, there's a number of factors that go into, you know, what it takes to run a town. Number three, the rates are affordable, you know, um, both in terms of the average and in terms of um, the indicator that we talked about. And then four, I guess it's not a conclusion, but your next steps would be, you know, talking with the fire district about a workflow. If you're going to use um, water use data, you'd have to purchase a utility billing module. You use U Munis for your um, accounting software, which is the um, the most common and probably the best software. So they make a module for this. We'd have to refine and finalize the customer database. Um, we were sort of joking that the best way to find out who doesn't have sewers is to charge them for it. But there is some, you know, some questions because you don't charge sewer bills. There is not a list of customers, which is very interesting if you think about it. So we'd have to actually find out who's on the sewer, um, determine the timing for a transition, and then um, begin public outreach. And that's, you know, that would be, 
this kind of a, a presentation, but more about why do we need to do it? What are we doing? What does it cost? What, you know, how come that kind of thing? And I already offered to Mr. Green that I will come to town meeting. I'm happy to come and talk about this because it's important. You know, I, I, I really feel for the rate payers and I try to do the best job we can to make things affordable and balanced. So I know that was a lot. And that's why I started with saying, I will go back over this as many times as you need me to, because it's important. Um, but I didn't want to keep you till 10 o'clock. And uh, I think that was about 25 minutes. So sorry. No, you, that was a little over, Mike. You're a little short on the time. I'm sorry. And so listen, I always learn this is not an easy topic for any of us, but you present it in such a way that it's understandable. And it's, you know, you can crunch these numbers five different ways, but I've heard this presentation now, I think, three times. And each time I feel more empowered to be able to explain it and make an informed decision what's right to do for us. So it's not a waste of time, Mike. You know, thank you. Okay, time for questions. Joe, do you have any questions? Uh, no, it was quite a bit to try to comprehend. Um, I don't have any questions right now. You call me anytime, Joe. Yeah, will do. Yep. Did you see the slides? No. Oh. Yes, sir. Any questions? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mike, I, um, the rate structure evaluation you had. Um, Example customer cost comparisons, and you had four items listed there the commercial, industrial, high usage, and supermarket. It would be interesting to add in um, two other categories, right, for lack of a better term, but one being nonprofits. So currently, nonprofits would be paying zero because uh, they don't pay taxes. And then what that would look like for usage or EDU based would be compelling information, I think. And then the other would be for septic users. So they're paying a sewer because they're paying a tax bill, but in this model, they would go to zero whether we go to usage or EDU. So I think that would be interesting to see that if we can identify a couple of models that we could then look yeah. at you know roughly how many nonprofits we're talking about dozens or i don't uh, know uh, to those with um pilot agreements i actually uh, came in with taxes okay so the interesting thing and i'm sorry ma'am i didn't hear the second one you said so those that are on septic. Those are on septic. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, they're not going to pay anything. Oh, their their bill will go down um, by the amount of... Um, can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so here... Um, I'm thinking usually when I do this, it's um, we're looking at like a, a overlay or a um, not overlay an exclusion, but in this case, I'm thinking that they their tax bill would go or yeah they're they they would not be paying that you know four hundred and twenty five dollars wouldn't be attached to their bill anymore so yeah they they would go down by that amount. Um, the nonprofits are already in there and I can identify them. Mm, most likely the easy ones are uh, identified by land use code. So you can always pick up like the churches and um, schools that it's another decision to make is, you know, are you charging yourself uh, for sewer? But yeah, yes, I understand. Um, and that's interesting too. And the, the, the nonprofit actually usually comes up with stormwater enterprises because they don't pay anything. And, uh, you know, that, but they're often a really large contributor of stormwater. So, but yes, to answer your question. I have those two categories. Thank yeah. you. Yep. <laughs> so, right now, the nonprofits don't pay taxes right now anyway. So the schools do not pay. Taxes right now, anyway, so that's not a loss to us. Is that correct? 
Churches, churches don't pay taxes to the kids. No, so they're not paying anything into the fund. If the move is to make it more equitable, yeah. that's what I'm getting. In general. Okay. So yeah. if the church is a high user of sewer, right. but doesn't pay taxes, they're not paying for sewer. Correct. But a home on Sefton over on West Road must also be like, they're paying. They don't use the exactly. So, the, so I'm just trying so to. So we're not going to lose anything from the churches and nonprofits as a wash. They were going to lose something from those that have septic systems going right. into the going to just going into the tax base. Right. Um, just to add another um, thought to this, when you think about the enterprise under either scenario. It's a fixed, it's a zero sum game. So if um, one is, if you're not careful, there's unintentional subsidizing and averaging. For example, the EDU, every house in town doesn't pay the same water bill, but they'd be paying the same sewer bill, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. And then the other one is um, for one group or customer to pay more or pay less, the rest of them have to pay more or less, you know? So if you want to, reduce the cost of uh, single family residential, you necessarily have to increase the cost of other people and you have a split tax rate. So you understand that, but that's, um, you know, that's the way the math works. It's like a water bed. You push down here, it goes up there. It's, there's no, um, it's a sealed system in a way. That was a poor description, sorry. So just the difference, you know, we do it like your school system, you know, Many people don't have children that go to the school or grandchildren that go to the school. They still pay the school taxes and part of the of your real estate bill. But this this is different because it has a, uh, a fund that because uh, people have subject system, they don't have to pay a certain fee. But if you have no kids in school, you still have to pay the school fee. You still have to, you know, sell it. You know, it's kind of a mess up. Mess up. Well, you know, and I didn't want to overcomplicate things, but you just hit a great point is that in my opinion, almost every community, if you're not fully served, meaning if every house isn't connected to whatever water or sewer you're talking about, I think you're all justified to put some of the cost to the general fund because they're, even if you're on a septic system, the fact that there's a restaurant downtown or a hotel or whatever is because there's sewer. It's things that wouldn't be able to sustain themselves on well in septic. So schools are included you know that that they're um the schools need sewer service or whatnot but that's you know <laughs> we can talk about that later but that's also part of the equity is uh you know it's not just the people that have a connection that get benefit from the utility exactly it's for it's for the community so to allow them not to have to pay anything I think it's not going to help us in, um, you know, when we transfer over to this, that the homeowners are going to, you know, it's kind of a wash we were talking about, but it will not be a wash, you know, unless you charge the uh, industry more. I just don't see it. I see the taxpayers, the cost is going to go up uh, for most taxpayers who are on the, uh, the sewer lines. If anybody, can, if anybody can come back and say that may not be true, I'd like to hear with that because that's a question we're going to get at town meeting. We need to explain that. Yeah. Uh, with with uh, that, you know, we have the answer. This is, you know, what it's going to be. Yeah. yeah. So, so Mike, when we set these up with other communities, the, um, the the people that are connected do subsidize through the rate structure. The people that are not connected, even though they're because because they are paying into the town. Well, yeah, and if if you think about um, the. I probably think about this more than the normal person, but if you think about how the town was settled and how it grew, water and sewer really were the backbone that allowed the town to get beyond a certain size, or at least to get the downtown, right? Because you can only go so far with individual well and septic. And that's what then builds the town around it. So you get these, you know, many communities that are served on their central business district with water and sewer, and they don't want it, nobody else wants to pay for it. But the fact that you have you know, uh, a gas station, a beauty salon and a pizza place and all that, a lot of times is because there's sewer there. So if you didn't have that, you wouldn't get that tax revenue. 
and you know you'd have to drive outside of town to, to you know get your car washed or go to dinner or whatever it is um so and, and not to mention the schools and the you know all that kind of stuff so it's the backbone of uh modern society is water and sewer Right. The other end of it is that the users pay, whoever you use the system, you pay. Right. You can pay a little bit more because you do use the system. I understand that too. But then it is, you know, you, then you get into the schools and they get into the plowing and you do my road, you don't do my road march, and I pay you, you know, my roads are accepted. I'm not going to pay so much in taxes because you're not plowing my road. You, you, there's a lot to that, you know. So just, and again, all I, I ask questions just to compare we you going to get hit with when we're talking maybe. And people, and people put a lot of time in this when you start changing things. So. Well, that's right. And it's important, too, to get ahead of it because people have certain perceptions and they will react to, um, you know, one of the things we talked about earlier is if you have an existing rate structure and you have to raise rates, you know, 8%, the first thing people will say reflexively is like, oh, I didn't get an 8% raise or I didn't get a Kohler increase for that much. Why should you? And, you know, it, it, they can be an inflammatory thing. And you say, yeah, it's 50 bucks a year for a regular house. And they go, oh, okay. <laughs> so you, you try to get ahead of people reacting to, um, you know, sound bites, if you will. I heard they're going to do this. You know, you want to make sure that you're presenting and you're factual and that, um, you know, I can't say I'm prepared at any particular moment in time, but for the most part, all of this stuff we can drill down into. Well, where did that come from? You know, you notice on some of my slides, because I, you know, I know what the questions are, but where do you get that? So I show where we get our data. We show, you know, we show the math is what I'm saying. Yep. And that those are good discussions. Yes. That's also why, John, our, our point earlier was we, we don't feel that we want to present this to town meeting in June simply because of the nature of these conversations. They're best had at informational sessions like we did for 4 ER where you're changing something and it needs to be explained. It's not, even for us on the staff level, you know, Ty and Bond, they deal with it all the time. That's their primary business. We have time, we need the time to observe this, educate ourselves, and then be able to explain it to the public. And that's why we pull the runway time between now as all this began to gel. To be able to get that to June, we, we don't have time. That's why it, you know, you've got the, a good snapshot tonight so that you can begin to think it through. But that's why we initially would prefer not to have this conversation until a special town meeting, probably in September. That's been our process spot to do. We're looking to see if this has to happen with the other two authorizations. That's the bond that was dropped on us today. And, uh, you know, this, since we talked about that, I, I really want to go to Greylock now and see it. So I'd be more than happy to come out on a Saturday to do a public information session that, you know, makes it easier for people to get to and blah, blah, blah. Miles will buy the donuts. Yes. We've got a great donut shop here in Adams. That's what gets people to meetings. I thought there'd be donuts. And the last general question I have is that, you know, we've done right this. This was built in uh, here again. 68. 68, and you know, we're going to do uh, a bond to uh, improve the facility again, a lot, a lot more in, in depth. That, that'll give us all, say, 25 years. So you're looking at an 80 year old plant at the end of this you know, bond, maybe 20 years, 25 years. How, you know, I don't know if there's any uh, metrics on this. How long do these type of plants last in a lifetime? So we're going to be Renovating and, and to you know, renovating what we need this time, but at what point you know, it's time to replace? Yeah, the, the, the concrete structures you have there, when we do the renovations, we'll be looking at the um, face of the final clarifiers and aeration tanks and doing more in depth structural evaluation and repairs. But if you repair and maintain these tanks, and they, and they do do that, they do take, and if you have redundancy, you can take one tank completely down and make repairs. Right now you can't, right? So this, these kind of restructures will last forever to repair them and seal them properly. They really will. It's also rebar is protected, broken, mm -hmm. you know, but it's the mechanicals inside that are the issue. Right. As far as your uh, your main admin building, Chris, that's a largely a concrete structure. Mm -hmm. As long as you keep a good roof on that, it's CMU concrete. Yeah, yeah it's t the admin building is tired. I mean, it's, I mean, if you walk through it, the, you know, doors, windows, things like that, it's a tired building, but 
Um, the structure it's, it's robust. It's solidly constructed for sure. So it's not going to fall down. It's just it does need some architectural renovations at some point. And that's not included in this. Bottom that's of not. No, we were focusing on the things that the need to be done. Yeah, to keep the plant running. Chemical areas and doors are the thermostat system. I think is in there. I don't know if that's a top priority one, but they have problems adjusting the heat within the building. Different. Yeah. So it, small HVAC things like like that that would make it more habitable and stable that energy were included, but not major upgrades to the admin. Okay, uh, any more questions? You do? I want to thank uh, both all of you, your, you and your team for bringing up this information forward. It's, uh, it's educational, there's a lot to it, but as it is, it's said, we're going to have a lot of community outreach and education uh, to uh, work to get this through. Thank you very much, all of you. Thanks for your time. I'll give you a mic. Card, if you want to go for a plant tour or I'm sure Dave would arrange it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Mike. Bye, Jack. Bye. Bye. Okay, now on to the last uh, well, new business B. Review town meeting board article to see bold petition to increase number of on premise liquor license. Jay. So I'll just frame this up very quickly. Apparently, this is last call for alcohol. <laughs> That's good. I'm going to look at it. Uh, 2016, I believe there was a, a, a conversation, a community conversation. 20, Madam Vice Chair, why don't you? 2017, there was a conversation about increasing the request in the state to increase the number of on premises liquor licenses in order to accommodate uh, hopefully what would be additional economic development in the form of restaurants, cafes, etc., that would be utilizing uh, on premise liquor licenses. One of them that was mentioned in the minutes that we reviewed was potentially a restaurant operation, cafe operation at is soon to be built Great Lockline Outdoor Center. So over the past, you know, COVID has had a double-edged sword, as, as we all know, and one of it has, one of the positives for Adams has been what appears to be, for lack of a better term, a, a bubbling or a resurgence in interest in uh, the downtown area. We've had some restaurants that have been interested, et cetera. We are concerned in being proactive that we actually may have demand outstrip supply for on-premise liquor licenses, particularly in the Summer Street, Park Street, downtown, Polish Mile area. We would like to make sure that we have the tools necessary to attract and retain, get planted, cemented, uh, a restaurant operator. And of course, the, the business model, the economic model is, is oftentimes beer, wine, liquor sales. So we want to be sure that we have those tools in order to attract business. Also, with Great Live Glen coming online, we don't want to be in a position, and I and Deb, you can go through the quotas if you want, but I think quickly, we only have two on-premise uh, licenses available at this time. And I can tell you that, you know, although not ready for public dissemination, there's at least two businesses interested that are very early looking on and have called and inquired, do you have a license available? So, you know, we want to plan for the worst case scenario, which is uh, we have several of these businesses. So again, with town meeting looming, despite the fact that we have a lot on our plate, we want to be proactive and we would like the board's consensus that if, would you like to see on the town meeting warrant an article asking the state to grant additional licenses? That's the best frame up I can give you. Most of you folks, uh, with the exception really of Howard and I, we're not here for those early conversation so if you have memories about it i don't know if i spoke about it but that's where we are today at the time the board did support the request uh, i think you did us at the time so I, that's why i was trying to be clear that it's 2017 because four of the five members of the board of selectmen were part of that conversation mm -hmm. and were in support unanimously the date of that meeting was september 6th of 2017 so if anyone wanted to look at those minutes those would be the Again, um, but that was the reason for Sorry, that's fine. So that's that's kind of if you have any questions about quota or anything like that, that has the uh, licensing authority admin support can answer them. But from an administrative perspective, it's staff's recommendation. Uh, 
that we allow us to put the warrant in front of you for next Wednesday and go to town meeting and, and get that endorsement so we can ask Rep. Eric, Senator Hines that it's home rule petition. The state has to grant it, so it's not different from really the process that we talked about changing anything with charter or special act. So that's why we, we just can't do it unilaterally. We have to go through this process because we are a town of formal government. But are you seeing there's any practical issues involved with this? Was it a simple economic development? We just need to uh, do brand new It's in there would be another tool for economic development. There's no downside. Um, oversaturation of the market is what people might say is the downside, but okay. I, yeah. Excellent. Right now, I mean, with as much interest as we're having, but Food establishments, yeah. I think they'd like to have the option if that's available to them. I will say that uh, when uh, I spoke with state rep a couple of weeks ago, um, I did mention this as an issue that is coming up against our quota. Is he can of going to the meeting and and that he would push this on in his role. So he would expect it, I guess. The other, the other, I think he would, he and I have since talked about it as well. The other aspect to keep in mind is the number that we would ask for. Uh, we, we talked about a particular number. That doesn't necessarily mean the state legislature will give us that number. Uh, so we want to be make sure that, that we ask, you know, for the appropriate number so that if they decide to reduce it, we still at least have a number that we feel would, would probably uh, fit in. The or if that's eight or six, we're not, we're not sure yet, but. I, I, my guess it will probably ask for an additional eight. Um, yeah. What would the state's resistance be? What would that be coming from? Probably the same things that the vice chair mentioned, saturation. You know, it's a different conversation when you're talking about off-premise licenses, because then you get into the saturation of you know, package stores, et cetera. In this situation, and as we saw in COVID, really the importance of, of liquor sales, you know, alcohol sales for economic development purposes, so, you know, maybe just for the sake of the state saying, hey, we're gonna, all right, ask for eight, we're gonna give you six, ask for six, we'll give you four. I, I don't, I feel we're in really good shape to ask for it simply because we we have the, the need, we can see the, the need for it. Uh, they may stay on the shelf, but I, I think from an economic development standpoint, being business ready, uh, we should have a couple in the pocket. Joe, do you have any questions? No. Any other questions from the board? I think we're all in agreement that very well bring us forward. Um, the last item on the agenda is announcements and good of the order. Joe. I have nothing. Christine. I'm all set. Howard. I'm all set. And I have nothing. Um, motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Christine. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Howard. This is a roll call vote. Joe. Yes. Christine. Yes. Our yes and yes. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.